Well, thank you, Jenny, for that generous, kind, and uh, very praising, over-praising introduction. Um, also, thank you to Sikai for giving me the uh, Lifetime Award, uh, about which I was quite surprised. I found out just after one of those bicycle rides. It did help to make me recover from that ride, I must say. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, gift to me from this community. Thanks also to the community of creative people and interactive art people who work in and around Kai and Sig Kai, because in a sense, the most important thing about my getting this award is that it legitimizes our rather strange work that we do from many people's point of view. So it's an award, I think, for the whole community and I think we should all be pleased with that, and I'm pleased for the community. And thanks, of course, also to Linda, uh, who Jenny mentioned, maybe didn't make enough of the fact that uh, Linda has worked with me on so many of the projects that I'll co cover briefly in the next few minutes. So the title of my talk is Creatively Crossing Boundaries. Um, the point, my point about this particular heading is that it's at the boundaries, over them, that the real action takes place. You know, what we need to do is not build walls, but sit on top of them, build ladders over them. And that's where life gets interesting, exciting, that's where the action is. And that's another thing I'd like to say that gives me great pleasure about the award. It's that I've always worked on the edge, on the boundaries, over the edge, not in the center. And yet this award, a lifetime award from Sikai, means it's kind of I and we are now seen to be in the mainstream, you might say. So that is quite exciting for all of us, I think. Being on the boundaries, being over the boundaries, isn't necessarily easy, and I always recommend it for excitement, for being where the action is, for making things happen, but I'm not sure I like to recommend it to people trying to get tenure. It's not <laughs> so let's just be careful about that. So creatively crossing boundaries, that's what it's all about. That's what my life has been about, and that's what this talk is about. And, you know, there are three subjects that I've been concerned with in my life. My love, art, which is where I started. My degrees, which were maths and philosophy, ending up with a PhD in logic, so that's what I'm like qualified in. And computing, which I got into by chance. Uh, yes, I did get a job as a computing lecturer without any qualifications, but I did eventually get a qualification because the British Computer Society made me a fellow of their society, which counts as a qualification in computing. However, I was already head of a computer science department by the time I got it, so it wasn't really much help. Um, and these are three areas, the boundaries of which I've been crossing. Maybe it's good to look at it another way which is practice, research, and communities. Practice and research together. I'll explain this in a little bit more detail as I proceed, but it's very central to my vision of the world that in areas such as ours, we practice and do research together. I'll say more about this later, but this is pretty crucial for us. And of course, building communities. Nothing happens without building communities. And Jenny already mentioned that back in 93, uh, Linda Candy and I started the Creativity and Cognition Conference series. That series itself was all about crossing boundaries. We did it at Loughborough University uh, with a little piggy bank of money and whatever to start with, but eventually, not much later, it became a SIG Kai event. It's still running strong. 
probably the best one ever, I'm not sure yet, because it hasn't happened, but this year it's in Singapore. It sounds very exciting. Uh, and it's great for neither Linda nor I have been contributing to it this year uh, or recently in any strong way, but it's going strong. It's become an important part of our um, work here. But I want to just hover on one of the conferences that we held back in 1999. Uh, this is an important picture. I've got to hover on this picture a little while. I have a few things to say. If you know, if you took the picture or you know who did, I'd like to know because I've lost track of the photographer. It's just a snapshot, but it's a really important snapshot. So I want to do it, deal with it in two ways. First of all, the people in it. Let me just go through the people in it. The person on the left, I think you know who that is. That's Ben Schneiderman. No doubt you were at the celebration of his work yesterday morning. Uh, so in a way, I don't need to tell you a great deal. Hopefully you were there and know a great deal about what he has contributed, both to developing the subject, interaction techniques, promoting it uh, in that way, but also as he indicated very clearly yesterday, promoting it in the world. So Ben Schneiderman, a very important figure in our community. I just should mention one thing about his achievements, which wasn't mentioned yesterday. Around the time, uh, uh, some years ago now, he produced a book called Leonardo's Laptop, uh, which, in which he addressed this very problem of creativity, uh, promoted it, and gave some important leads about how we might deal with it, in creativity support tools, for example, and so on. And he called it Leonardo's Laptop, and it's quite a very nice title, too, because Leonardo is perhaps the most famous person we have in our world who crossed boundaries, so someone to look up to for all of us. Anyway, there are three more important people in this photograph, uh, and I should say a few words about each of them. Second, uh, smiling uh, as they all are, but smiling in his special way, is Stellark. In fact, you might not have noticed, but Stellark did appear in the slides that were shown yesterday at Ben's uh, celebration. Stellark is a performance artist, uh, quite an extreme one. He, in fact, a few years after this, was uh, a keynote speaker at Kai. Uh, the thing that matters that I'll say about him here is that one of the things he really has worked on as an artist is augmenting the human with uh, mechanical, computer-based, and biologically based extensions to the human capability, about which I'll come to in a moment. So an artist is the second person in the picture. The third person in the picture is Gerhard Fischer. Uh, Gerhard is an, one of our strongest boundary-crossing uh, members of the Kai community. I've known him for many years, and we started together looking at unpopular things like the connections between AI and HCI and stuff like that. But he also is concerned with, if you like, the more creative side of life too. So there's Gerhard Fischer. And the final person on the right-hand side is Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky, of course, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, a very tough kind of guy. Um, whereas you might say, the way that Ben promotes HCI, as he was doing so effectively yesterday, that the main thing we should worry about is HCI. Well, Marvin, no longer with us, but used to promote AI in the same kind of way. AI can solve everything. So he was seen sometimes as a hard nut person, uh, but he wasn't so hard nut. I mean, I recall when uh, he visited our house, we had three cats at the time. One of them was, we always thought, the most intelligent one. And Marvin and the cat got on like a house on fire. And he spent a lot of his time walking around the house carrying this cat, stroking her. So he was a warm, uh, communicating person in this way, despite his reputation. So what, why is the picture important to me? Well, this is crossing boundaries. This is making connections. What Ben is doing here is he's we wearing Stellark's third hand or third arm. 
It's an extra device that Stellat made as an art object. And he's shaking Marvin Minsky's hand with Stellark's third arm. So what do I like to say this picture does? It shows art bringing HCI and AI together, making that connection across that boundary. Looked on by Gerhard, who of course himself did exactly this kind of thing. So what I'm going to do in the, this talk is go through some points in my history as a personal talk. I'm going to give. It's nice when you're invited. I didn't have to get it refereed. So I could say all sorts of things that would never have passed my referees. And I can be quite personal about it. Um, of course, there's a worry when you're offered a lifetime award. What does it mean? Does it mean the lifetime's done? You know, goodbye. Thank you for that. Um, but some of us go on. Well, last um, Friday night, I was at a concert, seeing a concert by given by someone who's pretty much the same age as me. Um, and he recently got a prize. That was a pretty big one, actually. It was called the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> and he was still performing OK. Well, maybe it was a bit rough compared to the early Bob Dylan. Um, and maybe it wasn't quite as imaginative and innovative as the early Bob Dylan. But it was a pretty good show. And so I thought, well, that's good. Maybe we old guys can still do something. Well, OK, my history. I started with painting. This is a painting I did when I was 20. It's the first painting I ever showed in a public exhibition, which was in London, in a group called the Free Painters Group. And you can see from the painting, that was a pretty good title of a group for this painting to go in. At this time, I'd not met a computer. I'd not seen one. I'd certainly not touched one. Not many people did in those days. Um, before that, I'd been painting portraits. They never won prizes. I did sell a few. But when I got into abstract art, I actually started to show. So I was an artist then. And if you'll forgive me, because of the audience here, I'm going to say a few words about art. I'm not going to tell you what HCI is. You know that. And hopefully you heard, you heard a lot about it during the conference anyway, things you didn't know. But a few words about art are worth making. Um, it's quite interesting. If you ask the general public, I think, the strongest modern artist that people talk about is probably Van Gogh. Um, but, but if you ask artists, certainly the artists I know, they almost always say Cezanne, especially the late Cezanne. And why is that? Why are artists so concerned about Cezanne? Well, because he was, he called it, he said, I'm an artist by inclination, not by profession, not by training, it might have been his profession, he might have been trained, and so on and so forth. But that wasn't the important point. The point is, it was by inclination. It was his life's work. It was his life's work, right? It wasn't a matter of painting a painting. The whole endeavor of the life was the exercise. And many of us say that like, each artwork is kind of an experiment. You know, so he painted one, and then he looked at it, and he thought, well, you know, the next one I'll do a bit different, because now I look at that, I can see I could have done something. Um, art, of course, is also challenging. Art is meant to be challenging. It's not about making pretty pictures. It's not about being beautiful, uh, although beauty comes into it. Uh, it's actually about challenging things, and certainly Cezanne challenged. What he tried to do was create sensations, I quote. Another important artist that was very important to me, and to many other artists too, is Malevich. Uh, Malevich, uh, maybe I should say a couple of words, was a, a Russian artist working in the early part of the 20th century. You'll remember that this year is the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, depending which calendar you use, let's say in November. Um, Malevich was already painting paintings of this kind of thing when the Russian Revolution occurred, but he and others for some years anyway, became very important avant-garde people, representing in a way some of the Bolshevik position, which was that science, that research, that investigation mattered. And Malevich said it matters in art too. He, in fact, became uh, head of an institution which he was an art college, which he renamed 
and he called it the Research Institute of Artistic Labor. So there we say, a hundred years ago, this man starting on a path where art wasn't, certainly wasn't producing pretty pictures, although in a sense they were very beautiful, but was investigation, a research investigation. And this is important to what I'm going to say later. You see the quote from him there, making art with the help of a law for the construction of interrelationships of forms. This is interesting and it's very important in terms of the computer because what it shows is that people, as long as 100 years ago, were looking at making art using rules, procedures, constructive methods. Well, at the same time, as I was doing this early art, I was also discovering the computer. This young man here uh, was using something called a teletype, which was an unusual thing at that day and is a very unusual thing today, of course. As Jenny mentioned, I got into computing by accident, um, or more or less forced into it in order to keep my job. Uh, but I could spell computer, so you know I was pretty good for those days. Um, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? I've got this job. What can I do? Well, at the same time, I was making artworks. And so I thought, well, how can this computing stuff help me or anyone with making art? And in fact, I had just um, proven a logical theorem in the top left of the image there, you see the first few lines of a paper I published in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, which was pretty good. But the Journal of Symbolic Logic would not have published it had I mentioned computer. So I used the computer to work out how to do it and then just showed them the proof. And what I realized was that this artwork that I was working on, the one you saw the picture of me there laying on the floor, stroking kind of thing, uh, it was giving me some problems. And I realized that I could use the same kind of computer program to solve it. And I did. And I wrote a program that helped me arrange these pieces for this artwork. This was 1968-69 that I made this, this piece. So now I was crossing this boundary. Of course, we had to be secret about it. Um, you know, my head of the Department of Computing didn't want to know that I was making art with a computing. But actually, the head of the Fine Art Department liked it, so I was open to it, about it, to some people in the institution. So this is a recommendation to people. And I worked with other people and so on, and we, I think a, an important moment to just dwell on for a few moments here is this paper that we, Stroud Cornock and I, presented at a conference called Computer Graphics 1970, a very early conference dealing with uh, interaction with computer graphics. It was held in Brunel University just outside London. And interestingly, they had a whole session on art. Um, and we presented this paper in this session. The title of the paper poses this question about whether the creative process would, be am would amplify the artist or replace the artist. Okay. This, of course, became a theme for many, many people. And it's still a problem today that many people think of computers as things that can replace human beings. And the alternative is that they can augment, enhance, and amplify human behavior. And you can tell which side of the fence I sit on. I'm sure everyone here must sit on that same side of the fence. But this sentence from the abstract, the advent of computing stimulates a desire to re-examine the subject of creativity in the context of art, became, if you like, the mission for my working life. Uh, one of the things we said in that paper, now you have to uh, remember, this is 1970 uh, that we wrote this paper. So uh, computers weren't exactly portable, mostly weren't even touchable and not very interactive. But on the other hand, we could see a future coming. And we drew diagrams. I'm not going to go through all this detail. But basically, we showed how in the future, computing would affect art mostly by enabling interaction. So interactive art would become the big thing. And 
So, pause a moment and think, what am I doing here? I'm talking about trying to use computers in art, and then what happens next? Well, facing problems. It was very, very difficult. So, what actually started to happen in my life was art started to drive an agenda for computing research. Art started to invent a future for interactive computing. So the crossing boundaries was one thing driving the other. Of course, the other way round worked just as strongly that the computing was driving the developments in the art. So this boundary was a two-way thing. And just remember, interactive art around 1970, well, the problems that we saw were human-related. I was doing stuff, I mean, I wrote compilers and did all that stuff that the hard-nut computer scientist guys thought was important. But what I discovered was, that was the easy bit. Getting the interaction right from a human-centered point of view was the hard bit. And we needed to, to develop new software development methods. All our students were being told uh, that they had to use the waterfall model, let me not go, you know, for, for developing software, which was absolutely useless for this kind of application. We needed new system implementation methods that would enable the new development methods to be implemented. Um, and, you know, just to take one example, I gave a talk in uh, London and the Computer Art Society subgroup concerned with art, in 1970, where I said that basically the development process should be iterative. Right? So, I mean, we all say obviously, but I'm afraid it wasn't obvious in those days. And I wrote it up in a paper, uh, which eventually got published, it's at the bottom of the screen here, uh, in 1974. But much earlier than that, a couple of years earlier than that, I submitted the paper to Computer Aided Design. It seemed like a pretty sensible journal to submit it to, and this is the response I got. Reject. If you don't know what you're going to do before you start, you should never start. <laughs> okay? So, the paper was rejected on those grounds, but eventually I published it in the uh, General Systems Yearbook because those General Systems people appreciated this point of view. Um, I was also working on communication. Uh, this is maybe worth mentioning again, that we're talking 1970. This is like not the World Wide Web world, not really the internet world. That was just, just beginning to look at the internet. But I was building a communication system. Actually, I did it with a soldering iron, not a computer program, uh, where people would communicate with one another on a very, very low bandwidth in something I called a communication game, uh, and where the artwork was about the communication between people. And the, the image on the bottom right is a recent reconstruction of this piece. So art systems for interaction. And so on and so on and so on. Um, you know, uh, we, would, we were having difficulty implementing the user interface, the interaction part, and we found pretty early on that one thing we needed to do was separate it out. So we used a microcomputer stuck on the front of a time-sharing machine so that we could put the interactive software separated from the main machine on this microcomputer. And then we started to work on uh, this kind of software architectures that would help deal with this, and so on. So again, the need of the interactive art was driving the kind of research that I and my colleagues were doing uh, in interactive computing. Interactive computing, HCI, by the way, in those days was called man-machine interaction. But people worked out that that phrase was not a really helpful phrase in very several respects, and it disappeared. But that's what it was called in those days. Now, so what does all this mean? Now, I think that a nice thing is to do with the bicycle. Um, maybe I'm prejudiced, as Benny indicates here, that I like bicycle, but you know, you, you remember that Steve Jobs made this famous thing that the computer is a bicycle for our minds because the bicycle is an amplifier of our physical capability. Maybe the computer uh, can be an amplification for our 
uh, mental capability. What you just saw there was a snap film of this guy actually breaking a world record in Leicester in the UK, but he had recently, this is 1992, he'd recently uh, won a gold medal at the Barcelona Olympics riding this bicycle. This bicycle doesn't look strange to you, I don't think, but it looked very strange those days. In fact, they had quite a bit of difficulty getting it agreed that you were allowed to use it in competition because people thought maybe it was not right. It was, you can see it's got a, the label Lotus on it. That's not the Lotus that we know. Uh, that's Lotus Cars. That's a company that made the F1 racing cars. They made this bike, right? Um, and the point about it is that it, unlike all the bikes that preceded it, it didn't try to give the cyclist advantage by making it lighter. It did it by reducing wind resistance. Everyone does that today, but this guy who designed this bike thought of this new idea, why don't I make a bike that reduces wind resistance? And then this guy, Boardman, managed to win a gold medal riding it, and so that was, he proved his point. But the important person was this man, Mike Burroughs. He was the man who designed the bike, took it to Lotus and have it, had it uh, built. After the world record was broken, here he is carrying it away, lovingly, you might say. Well, Linda and I were watching this, and Linda said to me, why don't you go and talk to that guy? Well, I did, but I didn't go and talk to the cyclist. I went to talk to Mike Burroughs, because what we were interested in was how did he come up with this uh, creative idea? And why did we want to know that? Well, we, I, I have been pursuing this business of how would computers help, well, if we knew more about how he came up with this idea, we might learn more about how computers could help creative design, as creative as he was, world-breaking. And, well, I'm not, well, I don't have time to tell you the story, but Linda did a lot of research, interviewing him, finding out lots of things about, about it, from which we were able to develop some guidelines for developing creativity support tools. Well, while this is all going on, of course I'm still painting and making art. Uh, I was making systems art. So I said I'd say a few things about art. I have to say a couple of sentences about systems art. Uh, systems art is art where the underlying structures that I use, the ways that the geometry is made, how the colors are chosen and so on, are is all done in a mathematical kind of way. So the art might look simple, but behind it there are very complex algorithms and procedures and so on to develop. That isn't actually new in art, because if you think back, that's what perspective does. So artists are not unused to that kind of thing, but in the 20th century, following Malevich and others, uh, they developed these other structures using this kind of thing. And it went on. I found in the early 1980s, so now we have Macintoshes and PCs and other such machines, I found that I could make generative art. I could make, in effect, movies. This one is a movie that was laid down onto videotape from a computer. Basically, each of these frames is not designed uh, and put together like a like a movie normally is, frame by frame, uh, but rather there's a set of rules, and in real time, the, the artwork is being developed uh, as you watch it. Okay. Uh, it's a very simple artwork because I was dealing with very complex problems. Now, we went on. We went on, and we're very fortunate to be given money by the uh, Science Research Council in the UK to study artists in residence. What was the point of this from the money point of view? Well, the money talk was this. If we could understand how artists use computers, collaborate with computer scientists to develop exciting creative things, we can learn about the HCI requirements for creative users. Okay. And that learning 
we postulated would give us lessons that wouldn't just apply to artists and designers and whatnot, but would apply to everyone. Because artists are just normal people, they just try harder to do, you know, they're more mission driven in what they do. They're normal human beings and the things that they need, we all need. Um, again, Linda, who should be getting an award here with me, uh, did a great deal of this work running these projects of these artists in residency studies. And there are two things I've highlighted on this slide that are important. One is they were practitioner-defined projects. The artists defined the projects. The artists were the leaders. This wasn't like, let's do some great HCI in our lab and bring an artist in and see if they could make it look pretty or something. It was the other way around. We brought the artists in and the artists defined what was to be done. And then the computer scientists and the HCI people scratched their heads and tried to work out how to do it. And the good thing about that that I found is that that gave the computer science people much harder problems to solve than the ones they solved sitting in their offices wondering what paper, how to write the next research paper, where they always seemed to choose a relatively easy problem to solve. The artists always gave them very difficult problems to solve. So practitioner-defined projects. And practice-based research. So again, practice and research together. What do I mean by practice-based research? It's worth me just a couple of sentences on that. It means where the making of something is an integral part of the research process, where the research result is as much the object that is made or designed as the evaluation results that accompany it. That to understand the results of the research, you need to see the artifact as well as the research paper. This is practice-based research. And this is what artists do. It's, I spent most of my life supervising PhDs that do exactly that. Uh, and this is what we did in these uh, studies. And OK, so lots of people getting together. We turned out collaboration was very important. Um, we got. Many artists in, uh, Yasune Otone, a, a famous New York-based uh, Fluxus sound artist came and worked. And it, I'm going to show you a little bit of what he did, but only briefly. Um, basically, what we did with him was use an electronic whiteboard right, as a creative device. So we, while he drew, he just drew on an electronic whiteboard. Right? And of course, when you have an electronic whiteboard, data is collected about where the pen is and how fast it's moving and so on and so forth. And we use that data not just to record what was happening, but also to drive other things under his control, things that he wanted to do, like make sound and like choose which image should be projected onto the whiteboard onto which he was drawing. Now, I'm just going to play you a little bit of this, but I warn you that this is not um, Chopin. This is Fluxus. Noise up. And so on. And we had many successful artist technology partnerships. And one of the things we learned most about was how these partnerships could work and uh, what kind of characteristics you need for, if you like, say, team building. What kind of things had to be done in order to make this kind of creative practice work. This was then generated into a book. Uh, this book, Explorations in Art and Technology, um, came out as a result of that work. We're now working on a new edition, bringing it up to date. But it has lots of reports on these kinds of studies. Um, then we moved, quite a few of us, to Sydney, Australia. This is a picture taken on one of our tutorials uh, on the harbor. Quite a nice place to do your tutorial. Um, and did a few more things, learning from those studies. We created beta space. This is for artists to work as part of the practice on evaluation of their developing artworks in the wild, right? 
and the wild in their case was in public exhibition spaces. So we negotiated with the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney to have a permanent space in which we could put from time to time different artworks for evaluation with the public in various ways. Um, Sid Fells and Kenji Massey made this piece uh, called um, I Am a Scope, which is an interactive piece, which was in there, one of the first pieces that we evaluated in there. Here's an image of some people interacting with it. And of course, you know, we knew about HCI rules and stuff. And so here we see examples of the art learning from HCI. We use um, video cued recall methods so that we let people do all this stuff. We videoed them, we played the videos back to them and then talked with them about what they were doing, thinking, experiencing and so on. So we're getting interested in art and experience design. So we're interested in now from an HCI point of view in engagement and experience. And we realized straight away that uh, the engagement that we were interested in had to be broken down. It wasn't simple enough to say, you know, were they engaged? Because you're in a gallery here in a museum. People come, they come back next week, they come back in the afternoon and so on. There is the, what is often called in the museum world attraction. Attraction is, do you actually stop and look at it at all, right? Well, there's a, so there's that one form of engagement. Does it attract attention? Do you pay it attention? Then the sustainability. How long does someone actually engage with it? That's quite a normal measure, isn't it? But it's different to attraction. And then there's forming relationships. Do you bring your grandmother? Do you come back next week? Do you bring your kids? Next year, do you want to come and see it again? Okay. And in art, this is pretty critical. You know, I don't know how many times I've seen Shakespeare's Macbeth he'd probably be pleased uh, to know quite often over my life, and I'll probably see it again, right? It's not just do it once. So artists always think about that. And one of the researchers, Zafa Builder, um, did more than 20 of these kind of studies and came up with this creative engagement model. I'm not going to go through it with you, but what you can see is that it's got phases that the nature of the interaction changes from time to time, as time progresses. You can't just say that the interaction is great for the first five minutes and therefore it's all done, because what happens in 10 minutes later? Maybe it's different. Well, it is different. So the HCI problem, if you like, was to understand how to transition between different phases and how to keep the interaction appropriate for these different phases. And of course, it depends what you're trying to do, what you care about. So, you know, we're used to easy to learn or easy to use, and they could be different. If you're running, if you're designing a control magazine, uh, a control room for a, a submarine or something like that, then being easy to learn isn't important. You can give someone a year's training, all that, you know, stuff. Uh, if, you're, if you're selling computer games in the shop, then it's got to be immediate all those kind of things. So we need to make decisions. But it's important to understand this kind of way that we see people getting engaged in different ways uh, as they proceed. I'm just going to play you a little video of one of the artists who was doing research with us. So this is someone doing practice-based research as an artist. This work was created whilst I was on exchange in Japan working with um, Dr. Kazushi Nishimoto who um, is affiliated with CCS. He works at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Kanazawa. Sprung was created in response to an earlier work called Elysian Fields. That work was using a floor pad system and had an animated abstract field of grass. And one thing I noticed as people walked around it was that they tended to stomp their feet even though the, the amount of pressure that they were putting on the pads didn't actually affect the work at all. Oh, 
I was kind of interested about the way that the representation of the grass being stomped affected the behaviour of the participants. And so I designed this work with springs to see if I could get people to use the, using the same floor pads to actually jump and spring about instead of doing that kind of stomping behaviour. So to cut that briefly, the point that came out of this from an HDI point of view is that play, engagement in play, turned out to be a very complex thing. And it became necessary to ask, well, what kind of play? What kind of engagement? Uh, is it uh, exploration? Is it uh, fantasy? Uh, is it challenging in some way? Is it danger? OK. And so and all of the point of Bridget's work is that, of course, depending which kind of play we're talking about, then the characteristics of the interaction have to be very different. I'll give you another example. In my PhD, I'm examining the development of interactive software for musicians. And the basic research question is, um, can using computers to visualise and transform musical performance enhance performers' understanding of their playing and encourage creative exploration? So what you can do as a musician is improvise with this toy in a way that the, the toy sort of becomes an extension of the instrument. Um, and as well as that, you can use the toy to perhaps highlight aspects of your playing that you weren't aware of just by listening. For example, slurs. If I play two notes, um, D and an A for example, and I try and s slur smoothly between them, you should ideally see two spheres, the D sphere move out and then the A sphere move out as I do the slur. If I don't do it smoothly, you'll see more than two. So you can see there that in addition to the D and the A sphere, the B flat sphere, also uh, moved, which meant that my slur wasn't that clean. I actually caught a bit of the E flat on the way up to the A. I'll try and do a smooth one now. Okay. Better, but not perfect. So uh, Andrew went on to look at how musicians interacted with these kind of things. And he found that they interacted in really quite different ways and he called them instrumental, ornamental, and conversational. Instrumental meant that they tried to play the visuals, that the visual was basically like another part of the instrument. Ornamental meant that what they tried to do was to make a build ornament around the sound, so that the visuals was kind of additional material that added ornament. Conversational was where the musician was actually responding to what the visuals were doing. And that was, a, if you like, a deeper interaction. Well, Andrew went on. I mean, he, he was my PhD student then. He's now running the research center that I set up in Sydney. And he has his own uh, PhD students, one of whom is Andrew Bluff. And he and Andrew Bluff walk, work with the Stalker Theater Company. And the Stalker Theater Company is um, a very innovative company that produces technology-rich theatre. Um, and so in this work, sound and in fact uh, vision, so people's movements and the sounds that are being made, are being used to generate images in the background. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of a uh, theatre piece that they've developed, which is actually a, a children's drama about Aboriginal people m meeting the Aboriginal life, the kangaroos and the koalas and whatever, in Australia. And so, just watch for a few moments. Dot and the kangaroo, an excerpt. And you can see the images at the back are being created in real time as part of the performance. And this is 
largely conversational in that during rehearsal, as well as at times during the performance, the performers themselves are responding to what is happening on the big screen. You can see the kangaroo clan have gone this way ever since Australia began to have kangaroos. There's a map made from these rocks across the land. How long before you humans understand? Every hill and every river, every tree is a story and a song, a place where we Imagine a stretch of the Australian bush. In that split... So, it would be nice to see more, but we don't have time. Um, of course, the HCI there is the HCI that the performers need. So it's, it's the interaction between the performers and the, and the structure that makes the work. So much of this was written up in another book. Here's this other book called Interacting, which Linda and I put together uh, not many years ago. Okay, so... All of this time, I'm still making art. My art is still developing. It's becoming easier to build some of this stuff. Uh, so actually, I'm trying to build harder things. Um, interactive, using uh, big displays, sometimes still painting, sometimes going back to the communications game idea. You remember I said I made this communications thing using soldering irons. Well, of course, then I came, I could use the internet. So here's a piece called City Tango, which is, this is uh, how it looked in Sydney. And at the same time, this is how it looked in Belfast. And basically the artwork had this simple first one, had these two elements, interacting with the people in each location and interacting across the internet. Uh, and public places, interactive work in public places, uh, in art galleries. And then there's this. This I want to say a little bit about. So this is a, a work of mine. You can read some notes here, but I'll also speak to the ideas. Uh, the piece in the gallery here is of the same class of work as this installation. It's generative. It's trying to deal with color in a complex way, uh, using software to define how the color changes and so on. Uh, but it, it's generative and it goes on forever, not repeating. But the rules that generate it can be changed. And they are indeed changed. And they're changed because there are cameras analyzing the movement of people in the room where the work is installed. And it's kind of interactive in the sense that if someone moves fast enough anyway, the work responds. But it's interactive in another way, which is that it, in, in essence, keeps a record of that movement, of that presence. The behavior of this artwork is different tomorrow because someone was in front of it today. I've had some of these works where they've been apart in different locations for months and come back together again and they look quite different because they've had different experiences. So in a way, what I'm talking about here isn't quite interaction, not interaction in the action response model, in the Skinner model of what interaction is. It's a more systems view of interaction. I like to call it influence, where one thing is influencing another. And the way I express it often is this. I play with a grandchild, and I love the fact that they respond directly, and we have fun. But I'm also hoping that in 10 years' time, we've had constructive play, and that they'll be different because of that play today. So that, if you like, the metaphor relationship is dealing with that. Now, that's not irrelevant to HCI in general. I'm, oh. Excuse me, I don't know what happened there. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I must have pressed a button today. Um, I'm going to make the point in a few moments 
I don't think I've got that many more moments, uh, that this business, this concern for the long term, for interaction over many, many weeks, months, or even years, is a very important problem. Okay. And it's not just like how you move the mouse, which is important, of course, but there are other problems. And these other problems are more to do with physical spaces. So I said that the work from communications games started to use the internet and move across the world in this way. This is a, this is a piece which is working between uh, San Jose, actually, and Leicester in England. Connected, interacting, responding, questioning, not being clear. It's not to do solve a problem. It's not to serve a purpose, it's art. Um, in considering all these things, it's important to notice that industry is finding creativity and art more and more exciting and irrelevant. So, as Jenny mentioned, I was recently invited to show a lot of my work at Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing, and I had a strong relationship with them, with my art, with the new technologies. Uh, we were, it was prominent enough to be on Beijing's news TV. Um, I'm continuing to have a relationship uh, with these guys about art. Okay. Many, many years ago, I was invited to lunch in New York by the uh, New York, New York uh, Festival of Art. But what I found was, at the lunch, not only were people we know very well, like Alan Kay and so on, but also people who were like on the board of IBM and on the board of 9X. And we had to sit around the table and say, why did you come? I said, well, you offered me a free trip to New York. It's good, you know. But people gave more sensible answers. Like one guy who was the head of uh, CNN said, well, I had something to do with television. The head of 9X said a more interesting answer. He said, we've got all this technology, and we don't know what to do with it. And we think you guys can tell us what to do with it. Um, well, back to a community. This was Kai last year. We, this is the first time we had a proper art exhibition. Uh, this was people unable to get in, having to queue up to get in. When you got inside, this is what you saw. Yeah, it was very crowded and small. Maybe you didn't see so much art unless you came back on a quiet moment. But it was very successful. And I'm very pleased to say that this tradition is continuing. And this year, we have a great show again, thanks to Tekla and Andruid and their team for putting this art show together. On this occasion, not in a separate art gallery, but in a separate space here. Uh, interestingly, Outside, in interactivity, we see some works which are pretty close to artworks, presented in a slightly different way, in a more demo-y kind of way. But still, maybe these people will come back another year and put their work in an exhibition that Kai will no doubt hold in future each year. What does this mean for HDI? Well, uh, I think coming out of this work, there's maybe new vocabulary issues. There are new things to think about that come out of looking at interactive art. So the artists are posing these questions. Jenny mentioned I'm producing a book on the art of interaction. It's about practice-based research and what it might be able to teach HCI. Well, I think that so far we have some lessons. I don't think I have long enough to read them out. You can go answer them. But there are lessons to learn from practice-based research in HCI. And here are a few of them that come out from this work. And I'm not going to read them through. But, uh, so we've made progress by crossing boundaries. We've pushed HCI forward in certain respects, particularly in support of creativity, which in my view is a very, very big and important human question, amplifying the human mind. But what next? Well, that was my last 50 years, and I think we need to ask a 25-year-old what's coming next, uh, but I can give a guess, you know, an educated guess from an old chap. may be quite wrong, but, you know, let me try. 
So what's my guess in terms of creatively crossing boundaries in the future? Well, certainly more of this, for sure. Well, I think artificial intelligence is there. It's an important thing. I'll say a couple of words about why I think that's an important thing. And of course, I remind you uh, of this slide, remember? We had that, Ben himself working, being friendly with Marvin. Maybe that was the beginning of something that could be in the future. I, this is another boundary that I've crossed that we haven't mentioned. Uh, but, you know, I've done, some of my art is written in logic programming languages from AI. Some of my art uses image processing technology, pattern recognition. The AI is used in the art. So that's another boundary. I've actually published stuff in that community. I also helped found the Intelligent User Interface series of conferences which, when I founded it, was sponsored by SIGCHI. Doesn't seem to have, it seems to have lost that connection. Maybe AI and intelligent user interfaces and so on is not popular in our community. But interestingly, they say things like uh, they welcome art, but if you look at the program this year, you won't find much, if any, art in it. Uh, so there's a lot to be done there. And there are major questions that are HCI questions that AI face. For example, the connectionist model of AI has won over the symbolic. Uh, the connectionist model is kind of secret, hidden. You can't question it. You can't get explanations from connectionist AI. It's quite successful in, in a sense, but it's quite a failure in terms of how we can interact with it and use it. And that's our problem to solve. We need to wrestle with it. We need to not shy away from AI. We need to say, hey, you guys, you need us, because you have a big HCI problem. Um, I'm running out of time. So I can't be as slow as I would like to be while I talk about slow art, which is another part of the future. John Cage, the famous uh, avant-garde uh, American composer wrote very slow music. He's got a piece which is, runs a few hundred years, it's still running, he's dead, but it's still being performed. He wrote pieces that lasted a long time. Um, and he had a nice phrase that I think is good, or a nice question. His question was, why are people so mean with their time? Why do you want everything to be fast? Well. We saw a bit of this in the uh, shaping space. But there's something which goes around the world now. It's called the Slow Art Day. And this is a picture from a Slow Art Day. What these people are doing is they've chosen a painting, and they've brought their chairs, and they sit there all day and look at it. They give it time. And there's something called slow TV. Uh, Here's an example of uh, a film I made in Rio de Janeiro, in Ipamina Beach, actually, looking over the beach. Uh, it's an example, this, you're only going to see a matter of seconds of this, but typically these slow TV programs last an hour or more. And they're like this. What do they do? They make you pay attention. Slowness is about paying attention. Slowness is an issue for HCI. It's not all about speed. This is a piece by Anthony Rowe. He wasn't one of my students, but I, exam I was an external examiner for him. And I'm going to cut this very short. But basically what this shows is an environment where people walk around and contemplate and meditate. That's another form of interaction. Uh, this one I'm going to miss. So what am I guessing the future is? I, I have, I need maybe two more minutes or three. Uh, that, well, I think one, one important thing is slow. That's meaning things happen over long periods of time, and it matters. And we need to think about the interaction, the HCI, over long periods of time, over years, not just over minutes. And it's different. And when you've had your device for a year or two, your relationship to it is quite different to when you first unwrapped it from that box that Apple designed so carefully. Smart, okay, 
I've said, I think there are AI issues that are really HCI issues. AI is all out there, but there are lots and lots of problems with it, and we need to grab a hold of those problems and think about them. So slow, smart interaction. But maybe there are better words, sustained, savvy, and I've already said influence. And this is a sort of picture of the future, but can I be a bit more specific? Where might we go? Well, yes, I can be a bit more specific. I think the older people here will remember that once upon a time, quite a bit of HDI was driven by looking at it in a particular context. It was the office. You remember all that stuff? Or if you were young, you'll know about it. Xerox Park and so on. Is there something we could look at now? Not the office, but something else. Well, yes, there is. There's a smart city. And I don't see yet much serious work on the smart city in our community, and that, I think, is an important thing to do. Where we would look at the smart city, so it's smart, living in the city, it's slow, it's long. You go past the same thing every day. Uh, and I've been working on this in art. I'll just... So... This is in Adelaide. Uh, you see things happening. The same thing is there all the time. You interact with it. You maybe puzzle about it because maybe there are blocks of color coming up on screens. You don't know what they mean, but you notice they're one thing one day and another thing another day. Um, maybe they're moving very slowly. Maybe you suddenly see a picture, you're in the mall, but you see a picture from some back lane, you're connected to the back lane. What is this doing? It's redefining the architecture of the city, the planning of the city, it's joining people together. The city is full of masses of data. That data is, is usable, is important. How do we interact with it? How do we handle it? Some of us in the art world are trying to wrestle with this problem. I think it's also an HTI problem. So. My conclusion is we need to think slow, we need to think fast, we need to think both of those things, but we need to think over long periods of time. In the Galapagos, we see the slow evolution of life as recognized by Darwin. We see creatures that live long periods of time and adapt over generations to their environment. That's what we need to be worrying about in HCI. Crossing boundaries, seeing what we can learn from one uh, field to drive the exciting developments in another. Thank you. What a wonderful talk. We have time for a few questions, so please come to the microphone as usual and give your name and Ernest will be happy to address your questions. Clarice de Souza, Bukihiu. Congratulations, Ernest. Uh, much deserved award. Um, you mentioned one of your early slides was, uh, had a quote by Cezanne about the language and logic of art. And we have been listening to discussions and seeing discussions about computers as tools. So I was wondering, we can look at computers as a language, as a medium, as a mode, as a tool. Um, do any of these perspectives present more or less attractive alternatives for art as a practice or art as a research? So I think the answer is all of these things, but what's most important is perhaps a way to address your question. The most important thing, I think, is that the computer and software represents a new medium. So we've moved from oil paint to acrylic paint, tempera. We now have computer software. That's a new medium. And that means when you have a new medium, you explore new things that can be done. What is the important thing about that medium? Interaction was one of the things I mentioned. Of course, one of the characteristics of this new medium is that the language is more explicit, if you like, than in some previous media that we have used in art. Uh, so it brings the visual art a bit closer to music in a way, so that we can do things that composers think are quite normal in the visual world. 
using software. But of course, composers, because they're used to this kind of thing, actually started using software as a medium in their art earlier. Now, a great deal of music is generated using computers and software because those guys were into it because it was a more natural medium for them than it was for many visual artists. So that's my brief Thank you. Any more questions? Go for it. Hi, Vicky, uh, University of Tokyo. I wanted to ask you um, about how you're reframing your research now. In, in Earlier in your presentation, you talked about um, being rejected, your work being rejected because you did not present an uh, outcome. Your, your work wasn't defined by an outcome. And so, is your work defined by an outcome now, or how do you present that? Yeah, um, it's, got, it's got easier, I think, but it's possibly got easier because I've got older. Maybe I'm more mainstream. That's how you get these awards, I guess. Um, but the, what I've discovered is where to place the results of the research. And I think it's in the context of engagement and experience and understanding that. And I think that what the research that, that we can do and do contribute particularly to understanding how to uh, grasp experience uh, and engagement uh, as well as generating results about that. So that is great. There are still technical things, and the technical things are not so difficult now because the main problem at the beginning was the one I mentioned, which was that people had this idea that you had to go away, get the requirements, write the spec, and then go and sit in the corner and write the software and then deliver it. And, I, and we do the hard stuff, and that's more accepted in our community. But even so, quite recently, I spoke to an extremely senior figure uh, in, in the uh, uh, secure and reliable software world who was very concerned about proving that the specification was used correctly to produce the software, which is important, like for aircraft and so on and so forth. And I asked him, well, that's great. I'm very pleased you know, that all, the, all your work, of your life's work, et cetera. I said, but I wonder, what do you think about making sure we get the specification right? And he said, oh, that's too hard. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, congratulations, and thanks so much for your talk. My name is Sue Ellen Strom, and <clears throat> excuse me for my voice, a little scratchy. Um, I'm from BCG, and um, I'm running a little design lab there. And I've been in the corporate world on and off for about 20 years. It's my second career. My first career was an analog career in art and set design and film. I, I have a master's degree in painting. and. Um, I have a couple of simple questions. One of them, I've always separated my artwork from my user experience work. Mainly what I do is UX, and I'm seeing all kinds of different models being introduced here, and I'm seeing the visual user interface maybe going away. That, to me, I, I feel like I've separated my, my corporate work from my artwork, and I, and I wanted to ask a simple question, how, how, do, how do I unite these things together? And I think it leads me to the next question, in, and that is, this computer stuff to me is so um, light coming at you instead of being projected away from you like film used to be. This is great, this is digital projection, but light coming towards you to me is, um, we miss some of the tangible, and I'm wondering, do you ever miss that as an artist? I see a lot of the, the computer stuff seeming to, to bring validity, but what about the tactile and the tangible, and how do we combine these things together as artists so we enjoy what we're making as makers, as well as bringing this research and technology into it? I'll try to be brief, but answer both those questions. The first one, I think that it's a matter of ingenuity to show how relevant the interactive art stuff or even paintings are in terms of helping us understand human experience and UX stuff. And I think if you're in a corporate world, my observation is you're better off than in a university. Several of the exhibitors in the art exhibition here are actually in company research labs, employed 
as artists in research labs because companies are recognizing that this matters. Universities are a little bit behind in this respect. The second point is, uh, I would say I'm a concrete artist. I'm interested in a concrete reality. I'm not interested in anything else. So to me, if it's projected light, it's transmitted light, ideally in, ideally in reflected light and transmitted light. The transmitted light is concrete just like the reflected light, but it's the concrete reality. It's not what lies behind the screen, it's the screen itself, which is the concrete reality of the object. If you look at my work in the exhibition, you'll see that it has a particular quality, and that's the quality of the screen itself and the way the light is handled by the screen. So it is concrete. But of course, artists are using, uh, are making physical things with computers too. Uh, I showed Stellark making physical objects, so it's not all, it's not all uh, lacking material, it's not all light. So Ernest just mentioned his exhibition. That seems an excellent place to stop and to remind you to go and see that. And let's thank him again for his amazing achievements and congratulate him.